So uh, today, I want to talk about some work that we've been doing, and the end result is looking at how you can better integrate application security testing into DevOps or CI/CD pipelines. Uh, but but the, the basis or the core of the research came out of some work that we did with the Department of Homeland Security. And what that looks at is the how do you calculate the attack surface of, uh, of an application, specifically in our case, a web application. And so if you look at the source code of an application, how do you know all the URLs that the application will respond to, all the parameters that can change the behavior of the application? And so what we're going to be looking at is how understanding that attack surface and understanding how it changes over time, how that can help you target your testing efforts. Because you know, the, the, like a real fundamental problem in application security is the scarcity of resources. And you, you have to, you only have a limited amount of resources, you've got to use them wisely. And what we're looking at is how does understanding the behavior of an application, how it changes over time, how can you use that to better shepherd your scarce resources? Uh, so, again, in general wise, we'll talk a little bit of the background of the research that we did. Uh, I'll talk about why I think attack surface is really important and an important thing to understand. Uh, I'll talk about what attack surface has to do with DevOps or how understanding attack surface can help you uh, better integrate security testing in DevOps. I'll talk about the hybrid analysis mapping technology, or HAM, uh, that is kind of the underlying technology that we've developed in order to do this. Um, I've got some installation instructions. Those are slides that we'll mostly jump over just so that when you look at the published slides, if you want to do this too, you can use it. And we'll look through some use cases. A lot of, uh, a lot of this will be demos. Um, that again, hopefully, if you're interested, you can replicate in your own environment. Um, my name is Dan Cornell. I'm one of the founders of, I'm the CTO of Denim Group, and I'm a software developer by background. And that kind of shapes the way that I think about application security. So I'm not a network pen tester that is now looking at web and mobile applications. Instead, I'm a software developer, and I've spent the better part of the last you know, decade or so. Um, looking at how the software that organizations develop impacts the security of those organizations. Uh, again, background in Java and .NET. And uh, I help run the OWASP of San Antonio chapter, so if you're in uh, San Antonio, if you're in Texas, please come by and see us. Uh, how many people here are familiar with OWASP's app? Awesome. That's great. So OWASP's app, fantastic web uh, proxy, uh, as well as an automated dynamic application security testing tool, or DAST in our uh, partner speak. Uh, Simon, who uh, is the maintainer of that, does a fantastic job. It's, it's really, in, in my opinion, one of the one of the really impressive OWASP projects. And so we'll use that for our demos today. You can certainly extend the things that we're talking about, or the, the demos that I've got today, to other scanners. Uh, but again, we'll use OWASP's app as an example here today because um, it's free and open source and because it's pretty awesome. Uh, again, these are some slides that exist mostly for you to have the links. Uh, if you want to download and do this stuff yourself. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the importance of attack surface here. Like, why is that something that is, that is interesting and important? And when, when I think about attack surface, and when I'm talking about that in the context of an application, in our case specifically a web application, it's really where does an attacker have the ability to reach out and touch your application? Where do they have the ability to provide inputs that are going to change or affect the behavior of the application. So from a web standpoint, most of this stuff is in the HTTP request, or at least the stuff that you're actually really concerned about uh, is in the HTTP request. So it's what URL is the uh, request coming to, what are the parameters and the, those values that are included, what are the headers that are included, you know, most specifically cookies. If you expand the view of attack service and think about mobile or IoT, this gets more complicated. Um, you know, with Android, you're thinking about intents coming in or URL handlers and whatnot. Uh, our focus today is going to be on the web application, but these techniques or this thought process can be applied to any type of application. Uh, again, for today's purposes, we're going to be looking at web applications. And attack service is really important from the standpoint of how do I do my dynamic testing? And that it can be both automated dynamic testing as well as manual assessment or penetration testing. Because the question is, like, what is the behavior of this running application? How can I reach out and touch this application, change inputs in order to change behavior, and as a result, as a, as a tester or as a bad guy, see 
you know, identify and find vulnerabilities associated with that. So what does the tax service have to do with DevOps? Uh, if you and you're talking to be accepted into OWASP these days, uh, it, it doesn't hurt <laughs> to have DevOps or Sec DevOps or DevSecOps or Sec Sec Dev Dev Ops Ops or, or whatever it is. <laughs> so whatever, whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> but in addition, in addition to being valuable and getting this talk accepted to talk about the, this here today, uh, I, I think that a tax service also has a lot of value when you look at what you want to do with security testing in a DevOps pipeline. And again, the stuff that we're going to be looking at today is focused on app security testing in a DevOps pipeline. This is not a replacement for other activities that you might do, right? Like if you integrate app security testing in your DevOps pipeline, it doesn't mean like, oh, well, we don't need to do uh, you know, penetration testing, we don't need to do threat modeling, we don't need to do all this other stuff. Really, the goal that we have, if you look at, like, what's the value that we can get out of security testing in a DevOps pipeline? What you're really looking for is how can we identify serious vulnerabilities far earlier so that the developers can fix those before they get pushed out to production and become a problem. All right? So again, this is not a replacement for your normal testing program, but these are some additional activities that you can undertake. And the goal is how do we find these vulnerabilities before they even become a factor? And, and again, that's what we're going to use uh, attack surface as a, as a lens to look at that. So organizations like Etsy and Netflix do doing amazing things to secure things via the DevOps pipeline. All right, really cool stuff. Um, and the challenge is to figure out like, you know, what, what of the stuff that they're doing translates to your environment. And that's an interesting conversation that I've had with a number of you know, larger organizations, older organizations, or organizations with much more entrenched IT. And they're like, hey, I, I saw this presentation. I want to do, I want to do what the empty guys do, because they deploy like a thousand times a day, and I want to totally do that. And like, I really don't think your mainframe software is going to get deployed a thousand times a day. Right? Like that's not, <laughs> there's certainly lessons that you can learn from these organizations, but uh, you know, like, like, you're not going to do exactly what they do. And so when we look at security testing in a DevOps pipeline, we break that into three phases. First is the testing phase, right? You want to do some tests, right? Just like the unit tests have an opportunity to weigh in, just like the uh, integration tests have an opportunity to weigh in to say, is this build acceptable to promote to production or not? You, you want security to weigh in. The challenge is that most security tools were not architected with DevOps in mind or with, with a quick turnaround in mind. They're optimized for thoroughness, which is a virtue, but not necessarily in this environment. And so the testing that you do or that you orchestrate from a CI/CD pipeline or a DevOps environment, some of that may be synchronous where you wait for it, but some of it may be asynchronous where you kick off the process and you have to clean up whatever mess gets identified later on. And with the synchronous testing, just kind of anecdotally what we've found is in a lot of environments, security gets about, about like 8 to 12 minutes to weigh in. Right? Like that's the time budget that security gets to weigh in on a build. Right, so you don't get to kick off a, you know, like a full, uh, a full scan that's going to come back 12 hours later with very thorough results. You have eight to 12 minutes. The question is, with that time budget, what do you want to do from a security standpoint? So once you've done your testing, and there's testing that you might be waiting for, you have to make a decision: Is this build acceptable from a security standpoint? Is this build acceptable to promote to production or not? And this is an area where there are a lot of pitfalls that security can fall into because when you think about it, from a development standpoint, if security is in there stopping builds on a regular basis, security better have a great reason to do that, right? Otherwise, security is not going to be invited to the next meeting where they talk about what stops the build. And so when you look at making a decision, maybe you want to say, we can't allow any critical or high vulnerabilities in production. Who would love that? I would love that too. In your organization, with software that's been under development for 10 plus years, where there are existing critical and high vulnerabilities, who gets to stop the build for two months until all those get fixed? You know, fewer hands, right? <laughs> right. So when you look at the decision making, it would be great to say no criticals or highs. What you might get to say is no new criticals or highs. 
And that kind of flexibility is something that we found is critical to organizations that want to get security testing into these CICD environments. So you don't need to be a security purist, you've got to be a security realist. And then finally, reporting. One of the things that we've found is, that is kind of a, a, a critical decision that organizations have to make, or a critical inflection point is, how do you report vulnerabilities to developers? How many people here email PDFs to development teams? How well does that work for you? Yeah, no, no way, no, not, not great. <laughs> One of the things that we've found is you have to integrate these results from security testing into the you know, JIRA or into the HP ALM or whatever the defect tracking system that the developers are using. You need to take advantage of those tools and piggyback on the investment those development teams have made both in the tools as well as the processes and the meaning flow and all that around it. And so from a reporting standpoint, if you're looking to do security testing in DevOps, you need to be judicious about, your, about what you report. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But you also have to report it into the tools that the development teams are already using. Otherwise, uh, you know, other, otherwise you're not in the flow. You're going to be ignored. So as I said, like many security tools run too long to include in pipeline builds. You know, we talk about that budget that you get, the time budget that you get in order to weigh in from a security standpoint. Uh, also, like an actual full security program is going to include manual testing. And manual testing is certainly going to be too slow to include in any sort of an automated build pipeline. But as we'll see, there are things that you can do with that knowledge of attack surface, uh, you know, and, and the knowledge of how that attack surface changes in order to inform the manual testing that you're doing. And so tracking attack surface changes over time can first help us focus testing action. Right. If you look at an application and you had one build before that was fine, you've got a new build now with you know, four new pages that are exposed on the application, where do you want to test? You probably want to test those four new pages because if you've tested the stuff before, hopefully you've identified any vulnerabilities that were there. And the most likely place to identify new vulnerabilities is going to be these new pages, this new attack surface that has been exposed. And so by understanding how the attack surface changes, that can help you focus your testing activities. Now, in addition, understanding how attack surface changes over time can help you trigger testing activities to say, hey, when I see enough changes that I believe new user stories have been included in the application, you know, maybe it's time now for me to get my manual tester to go in and, and look at the new stuff that has been exposed. And so that's really, like if you're looking at how to economize from a time standpoint where you allocate resources, Understanding the attack surface of an application and understanding how that changes over time is really, really valuable because it helps you focus first on what is new in the application because you know, the new stuff has never been subjected to testing, so we probably want to test that. But also looking to understand what behavior is likely to have changed because that's the next level down of the stuff that I want to test. So the technology that we use to uh, that, that kind of underlies all the stuff that I'm talking about, is we call hybrid analysis mapping. And the original goal of this technology was to merge the results of static and dynamic testing. And so if you're doing dynamic testing, looking at the behavior of an application, you know, with, a, with an app scan or a verb or a zap or whatever it might be, you get a set of results. And if you do static testing with the, you know, fortifier, check marks, verifier, whoever else, um, you know, that gives you a different set of results about the application. And the challenge that we saw in a lot of large environments was they were generating a lot of this data from doing testing, which is great. That gives you insight into the security state of your application. But very quickly becomes a data management problem of, like, I've got all this data and I can't sort through all of it. And so our initial goal with this hybrid analysis mapping technology was how do we take static results and dynamic results and merge those together or dedupe those to give a better insight into the security state of uh, uh, we built this technology out uh, based on some work that we did funded by the U.S. Uh, Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. Um, and the way that we built this technology, we calculated, we used, uh, you know, we, we built the technology to calculate the application of the tax service and we correlate between the behavior of the application when it was running and the source code that runs it. 
Um, and that, again, facilitated this aesthetic and dynamic merging that we wanted to do, but also gave us this attack surface calculation that we used to do other stuff. Uh, there's some interesting slides that talk about the things that we've done with the, you know, the, the DHS folks. Um, again, they, they, I, I think it's important to say that they have not approved this talk, uh, but I'm very grateful for the funding they provided for this talk. Just caveat. <laughs> Um, again, so our initial goal with the hybrid analysis mapping was to correlate between static and dynamic. And what we found was, once we had created this technology, there was other things that we could do with it that were, you know, potentially even more interesting. You know, like our scope originally was even more focused. We said, we want to take uh, HP, I guess, microfocus, uh, HP, microfocus, four to five files, and correlate them with watchfire files files because we saw organizations that had these technologies and needed to merge them together. And so that was like our very like specific focus that we looked at originally. How do we allow organizations to manage this data better? And so from a dynamic standpoint, everybody who here is familiar with dynamic application security testing, everybody, everybody knew about Zap, which is great. Uh, and so you first spider the application. All right, so you act much like Google would, where you start at the beginning page, kind of crawl around and find what are all the pages, based on the links in the JavaScript here, what are all the pages that are available to this application, and what are the forms you can post to, what are the cookies you can pass in, and so on and so forth. And again, from a dynamic application security testing standpoint, this also typically includes some sort of a, you know, authentication recording and session detection to identify so that you don't just hit you know, this is a home page. We worked with an organization once where they were very proud of how secure their web applications were, but they hadn't trained their scanner to look past the login page, so they had like the home page and the login page, which had no problems. But, but, but they hadn't trained the login, so they weren't looking at like the hundreds of pages behind that, right? And so, uh, again, if you're doing thorough dynamic application security testing, uh, you're, you're gonna have to do some authentication and session detection. And once you understand, or you've guessed, the scanner has guessed what that attack surface is, you're going to do some directed fuzzing in order to find problems. So you're going to send in a request, you're going to look at those responses and match those to patterns or do some analysis. And so if I send in a SQL control character and I get a JDBC error message back, like that's a good indication to the scanner that this may be, uh, you know, may indicate the presence of SQL injection vulnerability. And for our purposes of finding what looks like the vulnerability type, and we usually use the MITRE CWE, um, you know, the vulnerability type, the relative URL, and for certain cases, the entry point. And so if you think about a SQL injection or cross-site scripting, that's gonna have a parameter or a cookie or something that gets passed in uh, in order to exercise that vulnerability. But if you think about something like a, a bad directory uh, permissions, uh, you know, like a slash admin that you know, displays like a, you know, a file list or something like that, that's only gonna have a relative URL. So for static application security testing, we're going to take the source or the binary of an application and we're going to do some analysis on it to build a model and then run different types of analysis. And so we're going to look at data flow through the application, we're going to look at control flow through the application, semantics of the application, so on and so forth. And we're in this, in this case, we're going to find vulnerabilities that look like a vulnerability type and then a data or control flow path through the application. And so here we see kind of a, you know, we talked a little bit about send a SQL control character, get a JDBC error message back. Here we see an example of where, you know, tainted input come into this application via the get parameter call. That gets assigned to the uh, username. That username is included in that SQL query, and then that gets passed to the, uh, the execute, which is a sensitive function. So the same type of vulnerability, but identified via a very different analysis than, uh, you know, than, than we did from a dynamic. And so, again, both of these types of analysis have a lot of value, but they're very different, and they're providing different data. And so our goal was, how do we stick these types, uh, you know, how, how, do we, how do we take these uh, different sets of data and, and merge them together? Uh, so, a couple things that we need to do, we need to standardize vulnerability types. We use the MITRE CWE, uh, which is like the democracy of uh, vulnerability taxonomies. It's the worst one available, except for all the other ones. Um, but we've actually had a lot of success with uh, minor CWE uh, that's, that's worked very well for us. And the other thing that we needed to do, and kind of the fundamental problem that we're looking at is, how do we take the source code or the binary code of the application, and how do we understand how that's going to translate to behavior when that application is running? 
And that's really, uh, you know, again, was, was fundamental to us being able to do this static to dynamic merging to understand, well, if we're doing static analysis of the source code of the binary, how do we understand how that translates to dynamic analysis and behavior? Uh, and as we'll see, that understanding of how code changes translate to application behavior changes also feeds very well into the stuff that we're trying to do uh, with the DevOps testing. Uh, so basically what you do is you feed in a bunch of information to uh, our engine. Uh, and what it does is it looks at the source code, detects the language and framework, and builds an endpoint database. And it says, here are all the URLs that the application will respond to. Here are all the parameters that you can pass in that can change the behavior of the application. And, uh, and here's the source code that is responsible for that behavior. And then we have the ability to query that data structure. So to merge static and dynamic results, we basically say, well, hey, I have a dynamic result where I've got a reflected cross-site scripting and uh, login.jsp for the username parameter. Great. Query this data structure, it's going to say, well, the code that is, starts being responsible for that behavior is you know, login controller.java line 62. So if I have a static result that also says I've got a reflected cross-site scripting and the source function is login controller.java line 62, we can stitch those together and say, I believe that I have two pieces of information about one vulnerability as opposed to two independent findings that I need to create separately. So you know, I was sitting in a meeting with the, with the engineer that built this, and he kind of described, you know, you know, we set this up and he described like I built it, and I said, because I'm a jerk, I was like, well, that's cool, but what else can we do with that? And so that was the question. You know, we were successful in the initial uh, you know, research that we did. We accomplished what we set up to do, but we were looking at this, what else can we do with this? And what we found was if you understand what an application's attack surface is, you can do some really cool stuff with it. And we'll look at a couple examples of this here in just a second. But uh, you know, so if I know all of the application's attack surface, well, that's valuable if I'm going to do dynamic testing. So instead of the spidering process, I can shortcut that and instead just say, well, hey, here's the application's attack surface. This is what you need to test. You don't need to guess what the application's attack surface is. I'm going to give it to you. And similarly, the other way, if I have this data structure and I've done dynamic testing, but I haven't done static testing, that lets me communicate to the developers, not as well as if we have static testing, but it lets us communicate to the developers to say, why have this dynamic result? Here's where you need to start looking at the source code in order to address this issue. Um, so, uh, one of the, the first thing we'll look at here is the scanner seeding. And so, again, when you do these dynamic tests, you have to go in and the scanner you know, starts with the home page, looks at the HTML, the JavaScript, and makes a determination. Okay, well, here's the other pages I can go to, here are the forms that I can submit. And in an iterative process, goes through and crawls the application to identify that. But there are potential problems with that. So if you know, there may be landing pages that link in to parts of the application, but you would never see a link to from the application. There may be parameters that you wouldn't see, hidden directories, hidden or unused parameters. My favorite example of this is I did some work many years ago on a, uh, on a cold fusion application. Right? And if you pass the param if you pass in a parameter named D, whatever the value of D was, the application would delete the order with that number. So if you passed in D equals 1,000, it would find order 1,000 and delete it. Sure. Why, why would you do that? <laughs> you know, and, and, and in this case, I don't think it was a malicious backdoor. It was a utility function that a developer had put in there that had been, as happens with cold fusion applications, like cut and pasted across the entire application, right? But if you're testing an application from a dynamic standpoint, you're not going to know about that. that, that that's unreasonable for you to like, anticipate these weird parameters that may be passed in, you know, whether those are intended to be backdoors or just uh, you know, weird functionality. And so what we can do is precede scanners in order to give them that information. And so again, what we're doing with this is we're going to enumerate the attack source. We're going to find all of the URLs that the application will respond to. We're going to find all the parameters that might change the behavior of the application. And using that knowledge, we're going to do different things. You know, first, we're going to look at seeding a scanner. And so again, what we talked about, you know, are there hidden landing pages? You know, are there multi-step processes that the crawler, for whatever reason, can't figure its way through? Uh, unknown parameters, debugger, backdoor parameters. And this is also something we found to be very useful for REST APIs. If you've got like a Java Spring REST API or something like that, 
Again, that's not something you're going to be able to crawl based on HTML and JavaScript evidence. But if you know about this, then you can enumerate this API and know from a testing standpoint what you need to test, what you need to fuzz. So. So what we've done is we've taken this engine and we've uh, created a command line version of this, right? So you can basically like point at the source code and it will. So 
my warning about the, the sample code that we have available is uh, it's, it's well, my warning is that it was written by me uh, and all of, all of that entails. Uh, so you got to be careful. I would I would attach this code to a publicly uh, unauthenticated accessible web server, uh, but there's some interesting stuff that we can do with it. And so we've got this attack surface live uh, pipeline file. And what it does is it takes uh, JSON output, that command line client that I talked about before that'll also dump out JSON instead of uh, you know, just text. And it takes the output of that JSON and it will create an attack surface tree data structure and it will allow you to calculate the differences between trees. Uh, and also has some like get handling uh, utility tasks. And so that's the basis of a lot of stuff that we're looking at, uh, that we're gonna be looking at. I won't go too deep into this because from a visualization standpoint, my, my uh, user interface or user experience skills are on par with my Python coding skills, so they're not great. Uh, but it's interesting to be able to look at the attack surface of an application, and it's especially interesting to be able to start to look at comparisons of those. And people that are better at user experience can probably create better visualizations. But what this attack surface live in Python file lets you do is to take you know, two different versions of an application and to say, show me stuff that is new, show me stuff that went away, and as we'll see, also show me things that might have changed or the behavior might have changed. And so, you know, if you're looking to communicate about an application over time, uh, again, that's, that's potentially valuable and, and interesting. What's more interesting to me is to be able to look at these diffs in a structured manner. And so, uh, we've got some uh, a script that wraps this that lets you basically go in and take two versions of an application. <coughs> Probably good. So we can take two different versions of an application. And for this, for our purposes, we're going to look at two different Git commits. surface at both of these points in time and determines what are the parts of the application that are new and what are the parts of the application that went away. And so what we see here is between these two commits, we've added the attack surface of these four additional uh, URLs. Uh, we haven't deleted any in this case. And we can do some metrics to say like what percentage of the application of the attack surface has changed. We've played around with some things looking at like what are good metrics for like a trigger criteria to say, well, we need to like schedule a new test. Um, you know, look at percentage of changes in the URLs that have changed. And, and, and honestly, we, we don't, we, we haven't come up with anything great yet uh, in the environments that we've worked with this stuff. But again, knowing what the attack surface was before, what it is now, you can calculate things like the percentage that is, uh, yeah, that is new. What we can also do, because we are looking at the file to change, you know, so we can calculate, here's what is new, but we can also potentially calculate, here's what is modified. So by understanding the files that have changed and correlating those source code files to the attack surface, that gives us an indication of what has actually changed in this application, right? If I change the source code file and the source code file is partially responsible for this behavior, maybe that behavior has changed. And like the, the calculations that we're doing, and I wanna I want be clear, like the, the calculations we're doing here are not as good as if you were doing a full data flow or control flow analysis, right? Right. So if you like you had like fortifier check marks or whatever, like you just grind through the application, like it's going to know more about the application, but it's also going to take a lot longer. If you've seen how fast this stuff runs, like this stuff runs pretty pretty quick, right? It's a basic uh, tokenizing parser, basically doing like a you know, high level semantic analysis of the application. And so a design goal for us was to run very quickly. And so what that lets us do, again, identify stuff that's new, stuff that, is, uh, that went away, but it also lets us make a guess at things that have changed between different versions of this application. And so we have, if you look at an application, we can now partition it to say, you know, here's stuff that went away, and I don't care about testing that because if the attack surface went away, nobody can hurt it, right? But here's the new stuff. I'm probably the most concerned about that because that has never been subjected to any sort of testing. Here are things that may have been modified that's maybe the next level down that I'm concerned about because you know, people change code, maybe they you know, pulled in an input or you know, didn't, didn't, you know, attach something to a SQL query or something like that. And then I have the parts of the application that as far as I know haven't changed. 
And those are probably my lowest priority from a testing standpoint. And so this knowledge of a tax service, being able to watch this tax service as it changes over time, uh, you know, gives us some insight into how the application behavior can change. And as a tester, that lets me potentially focus my efforts uh, based on my knowledge of how the application is, is changed over time. So, how do we use this in a DevOps pipeline? As I talked about before, one of the interesting things that we've seen is we've worked with organizations, and, and, and the security teams in these organizations, they're, they're terrified, right? Because they feel like, hey, we have made, over the past couple years, we have made like tremendous strides. We're finally getting testing, like before a release or once a year, quarterly, right? You know, and, uh, and, and maybe as the security period, you look at that, and you're like, oh, we should be testing more, we should be testing better. But like, if you look at real enterprise environments, the progress these organizations have made to start to integrate security testing as an activity in development, they've made tremendous progress. And then DevOps comes along, and they say, okay, all the rules we behaved uh, according to before, those are gone. Right now, we're doing like a million, you know, a million releases a day, blah, 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 right? And the security people we talked to are terrified. They're saying, like, we don't want to be marginalized now. We've made all this progress. We don't want to lose the progress that we've made. And so, how can you use, so, so the concern is how do we keep application security testing relevant in development? How do we get it into the, you know, into the pipeline? That's even better. And so one of the things you can do is you can look to target that testing to say, if I only have X amount of minutes in order to weigh in from a security standpoint, it's really valuable to me to be able to test only the stuff that I think is the most likely parts of the application to have vulnerabilities. And again, we talk about some, uh, you know, some you know, calculated statistics. Uh, you know, potentially that lets you set a threshold. That's something where we haven't found good hard and fast rules here, things that work really well. That's something we're still working on. But to understand, like, what percentage of this application has changed since the last time we did testing? How can we use that as a trigger event in order to say, oh, hey, you know, we've got like 30 new URLs, or 10% of the application attack surface has changed. Now I need to schedule a new manual penetration test. And it's also something we found to be valuable to integrate into chat ops, right? How can you make developers aware of when they check code in, how can you keep them aware of how the attack surface has changed? How can you make them cognizant of, hey, you added this code and the application got this much bigger from an attacker's standpoint? So there's some really interesting things that we've been able to do, and as I said, with the you know, kind of looking at the thresholds and things, that uh, we're, we're still working in order to identify What's, what's the best way to use this information for to drive behaviors? Um, so, what we uh, you know, the example here, this attack service notifier watches a Git repository for new commits. And when there are commits, what it does is it checks to see if new attack service has been included in the application. And on an attack service change, it's going to do stuff. So, in a production environment, this is going to be moved to you know, your Jenkins plugin, your CI CD server. Uh, and we've done some of that for, for, for other environments. For demo purposes, this is basically just like a, a loop that uh, busy waits and that you know, checks, uh, you know, ch checks a Git repo. Um, and again, what it's going to do is going to watch this Git repository to see you know, what has changed or has this application changed. And based on those changes, it can then trigger different activities or trigger different behaviors. So we set this up and it's going to watch this Git repository. And it's going to keep pulling the latest down from Git and, uh, and, and, and watching for changes. So. so if we 
create new attack surface for the application. And commit that. So what we see is this thing detects the change in the Git repository and identifies, like, hey, this new attack service, you know, this new page, basket.33, you know, basket has been added. And what we see on the other side of that is that we can do things like push that information out to Slack, right, where you've added attack service 33. You know, we can do things to calculate to say, well, we've added 10 new pages, let's put a JIRA ticket in for the security team to queue up the security test or whatever else that might be, right? What we can also do is, and, and what is particularly more interesting, is to say, let's target testing based on this, right? So it's great to be able to notify people, it's great to be able to follow along with this. What we potentially also want to do Good sign. What we potentially also want to do is to say, hey, let's only test the new parts of this application. And so if you look at doing like a full app scan, scan or full zap scan or burp or whatever dynamic testing uh, tool it might be, for a substantial application, that can be you know, a several hour change, right? Or, or several hour activity that you've got to wait for. But if you can tell the scanner, hey, I only want you to look at these pages that are new, or I only want you to look at these pages that have changed, or where the behaviors have potentially changed, you can shrink that. So, if we run that same attack service notifier, but instead what we want it to do is to watch for these changes, and we can use and orchestrate So we're watching this repository again. And what we can do from there is go in and add new pages. So if we copy search.jsp. So what we're going to do is we're going to push this new uh, file into the uh, into the repository. Our uh, scanner identified, or our, our thing that was busy waiting identified that that was there, and then it goes in and does a test only of that new piece of attack surface. And so what we see here is like this this ran, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, Zap run pretty quickly. And what we identified is, hey, this new page, you know. Added the new attack surface to search 41, it deleted no attack surface, and the result of the zap scan of this one specific uh, page in the site yeah. So we only did a test of that, and that identified hey, this commit that you just made introduced a new cross site scripting vulnerability to the application. And it submitted it to the JIRA, it you know, posted it up to Slack and, and, and HipChat, and you know, also posted here to say, the change that you just made a minute ago to the application changed the security state of that application. And it ran, and again, this is one page run with that. But if you think about it, like if you think of like a, a pull request and things like that, how many new pages do you introduce in a commit or in a pull request? And so what we've done here is we've shrunk down the time to get dynamic testing done 
and focused it very specifically on the parts of the application that are most likely to contain vulnerabilities. And again, we can look at the most likely stuff, which is the parts of the application that are new, that have never been subject to security testing. We can expand that, if we have the time, we can expand that to parts of the application that have changed. But what we've done now is made it so that on every commit, the developers get immediate feedback to say, what you just pushed into the repository changed the security state of the application for the worse. And from a remediation standpoint, if you can give the developer that level of feedback or that quick of a feedback, you're letting them know, hey, you need your, what you just did wasn't good. So what you need to do is you need to go in and fix what you just did. That's a lot more attractive in a lot of cases versus, you know, at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, getting a notification that says, like, hey, by the way, this thing you did like many, 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 many weeks ago, there were problems. And for the record, this is the architecture that they have the live. Yeah. We talked to GitHub, we talked to like three different web servers. When I did this, at a, I actually demoed this at, a, at, at the Black Hat Arsenal this year. And usually I spend a bunch of time prepping for the demo uh, to make sure that it works because there's so many moving parts. And I had, you know, like press interviews and uh, customer meetings. So I, I thought I was like stacked up and rolling in. And so I like walked into my time at the Black Hat Arsenal and just like opened my laptop and started. And everything worked except for the last demo. So we go through like, okay, we well, do this, we do this, we do this. And we pull it all together, you get a Python stack trace. And we repeated that every 15 minutes, like the way that the Arsenal worked. <laughs> so, so I'm happy that it worked today. Uh, happy that it worked today. Um, so, like kind of what, what I want to, like my goal with this is to expose this capability out to folks, to, like, to, to get people talking like what is the application, is the attack surface, what implications does that have for our testing, what do we want to be able to do based on that, uh, and again, I want to provide some easy ways for folks to get out and play with this stuff. Um, and uh, you know, I've also got an example, and you can pull this, uh, you know, like a, the code is written in a combination, the core code is written in Java, the different code is written in Python. Uh, but you can also run this all via Jython. So if you're if you're a Python person, you can you know, you'll load this stuff in and uh, you know, and, and use Jython to script this natively from, uh, you know, from from Python. And so, really, what I want to do is open this up. Uh, like our, our 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 next goals with this is to expand the model of application attack surface. Right now, we're very focused on parameters uh, and HTTP verbs. What we could be doing as well is HTTP headers, most specifically cookies. Uh, and, and also, this technique can be applied to other application types.